created a whole summary based on some emails we exchanged. You know, we then spent about four hours on the phone back and forth. We had it all ready by uh, Friday night. It's up on the web. You can kind of read with some of the imagery, some of the data. Uh, you'll have a lot more data this afternoon, but if you want to t turn your friends on who were not able to be here, if you want to give them a summary of why it's important, what's been held back from them, and where they can get a summary of what happened in Washington, the uh, Russian piece uh, with Ken's photo and mine, with the Russian flag in the middle, which was designed by David, um, is the place to go. This man is the beginnings of both the problem and the potential solution to our, our NASA conundrum. Because what White David Eisenhower, President of the United States, ex-general, ex-supreme allied commander, etc., won World War II, when he was elected, he was bombarded by an incredible outpouring of reaction to the launch of Sputnik on October 4th, 1957. And in hindsight, when he said, it's really not that significant, that's interesting because he was correct. Technically, it wasn't. Politically, it was everything. So in response to pressure, he was forced to create an agency that would prosecute the exploration of outer space from this government. And instead of allowing one of the services, you know, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, to be the lead space agency, he created what we have thought all these years was a civilian space agency, i.e. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Well, the problem is that if you read the fine print, it turns out from the get-go that NASA is not a civilian agency. In fact, if you look specifically, you'll find that in Section 305, it says quite precisely that for the purposes of this section, it is a defense agency of the United States. This section, by the way, has to do with technology. And leaping far ahead to the end of the story, if NASA did go to the moon and found umpteen broken bits and pieces of alien technology, this very section would have given them the 100% legal right to classify all of it, and none of us would ever have been allowed to know, including most of NASA. So when people look at me and say, but how could they hide it? Well, the law said they have to hide it because it comes under this section of the U.S. Civil Code. Now, there's another section, Section 205. This one says specifically, no NASA information, I put in the NASA in brackets so that you know, for those that are not familiar with the act, you can see the continuity. No information which has been classified for reasons of national security shall be included in any report made under this section of the act. Now, reports are part of the, of the overall structure of the Space Act because it, it instructs NASA that it must periodically report to Congress uh, what it's found and its progress, how it's spending money, the various development programs, you know, missions, status, success, and results. This section specifically prohibits NASA from providing any results that are deemed of a national security threat and are classified by the president and any of his designees, like the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Council, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at the act, it turns out in law, we are not living, we have never been live, living with a, with a civilian space agency, but in fact, we have been living with a lie. It's been told to us that it's a civilian agency, but in fact, as one of the Russian questions from one of their major news agencies asked Ken yesterday, does NASA have any affiliation with the defense ministries that's so Russian, you know, defense ministries, to which we were able to simply quote them from the act, not only affiliation, but NASA is considered under law a wing of the U.S. Department of Defense. Which brings us now to this man. Because what Mike and I have found regarding NASA, regarding President Kennedy's amazing statement initiating on May 25th, 1961, 
By the way, isn't it interesting that Star Wars premiered on May 25th, 1977? You think that's an accident? Nah. Anyway, the president basically announced this plan. This is Apollo. By the way, Mike's going to talk to you about the patch in some detail, and you will see some very interesting continuity going on. So Apollo took place from Apollo 11, 12, 13, not counting, of course, the, the orbit mission of Apollo 8. And within days, we now discover, within days of holding a, a major joint session of Congress, announcing Apollo as a race to beat the Russians to the moon, these two men met in Vienna in June, on June 4th, I believe, uh, for their first summit. And this man on the right, began a relentless campaign that we can document, and Mike will go through the specifics, a relentless campaign with this man to basically give Apollo away, to go to the moon jointly with our most feared and hated enemy on the surface of the planet, i.e. the Soviet Union. So while everybody is talking space race, and we're going to beat the commies, we're going to show what democracy can do and all that, and technological supremacy is critical, and getting the high ground and showing them that we can go to the moon, and democracies can leave this planet, while all that was being said, the lie was behind the scenes. These two men were discussing and discussing and discussing how to do it together. And that, to me, is a most astonishing revelation leading, Mike and I now believe, directly to the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And we will lay out in the next few minutes how that all took place. As a side effect, as an adjunct to this research project, I believe we have figured out one of the major geopolitical mysteries of our time, a mystery so great and so deep that when Bill Clinton was elected president, he gave Webster Hubble, his close friend from the Rose Law Firm, two directives. Find out if UFOs are real, go to the Air Force, go to NORAD, find out. And the other thing he asked him to do was find out what happened to John Kennedy, how and why he was killed. And this is in Webster Hubble's book. And we all know what happened to Hubble. We all know what happened to Bill Clinton. We all know what happened to the eight years in the Clinton administration. All hell broke loose, and they became targets of every possible character assassination one could bring up. And I believe, in my heart of hearts, it was for Bill Clinton asking these two very relatively naive questions. He should have known better. The fact that he asked them, and the events then ensued, raises a whole bunch of other things that we don't have time to get into this morning, so we will not. So with that as prologue, in my role, my former role as CBS science advisor during our missions to go to the moon, for this most trusted man in America, I would like to give you the man that I trust on my dark mission the most, Mike Barra. So what I want to do is just real quickly cover some of the basics that are in the book about how this thing all started. And it really started with this image right here. This is uh, Viking frame 35A72 from 1976. And it is the original uh, version, processed version, actually processed by NASA of, of the face on Mars. This is what started the whole um, controversy 